A very good evening and welcome to the Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Xuan Yeo and I'm one of the two Ath Fellows this year. Critics of higher education have attacked liberal education for its perceived irrelevance and elitism compared to vocational instruction. However, is there really a dichotomy between the two? Our very college takes pride in our ability to combine both effectively. In its inauguration address, President Hiram Chodar said, and I quote, through the genetic infusion of liberal arts and leadership, CMC puts the liberal arts in action. This double helix has been, is, and will be the key to our success, end quote. Our speaker tonight will weigh in on this debate and present his own defense of a pragmatic liberal arts education. Michael S. Roth is the president of Wesleyan University, where he has served since 2007. Roth was previously the Hartley Burr Alexander Professor of Humanities at Scripps College, Associate Director of the Getty Research Institute, and President of the California College of the Arts. As a writer, he has authored six books. His most recent book, Beyond the University, Why Liberal Education Matters, is a stirring plea for the kind of education that has, in his opinion, since the founding of the nation, cultivated individual freedom, promulgated civic virtue, and instilled hope for the future. He also regularly writes essays, book reviews, and commentaries for the national media and scholarly journals, and continues to teach undergraduate courses online through Coursera. President Roth's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Salvatore Center. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming President Michael Roth to the Athenaeum. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is so strange to be speaking to you. I have given this talk a lot in many places around the country. Not the same one you're going to hear. They're always a little different. Uh, but I'm just going to turn this on because I have one quote I want to make sure I um, don't mangle. But I was here as a professor um, in Claremont from 1983 to 1995. I was here when they built this place, uh, the Athenaeum, and Jill Stark uh, and I were co-conspirators. Uh, I don't know if Jill would, she, was, doesn't, she didn't act like a conspirator, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but she was an extraordinarily effective a leader on this campus, as was, of course, her husband, Jack. And uh, it was my great, great uh, privilege to work with her. And I taught at CMC um, my first couple of years in Claremont. I was explaining to uh, the students at my table that uh, CMC was short a European historian, and I was short of money. Uh, and and uh, so for my first couple of years, I would teach an overload and teach European history 1648 to the present, um, yeah, whoosh, went right by um, here um, uh, in, in the, uh, mostly in the 1980s. So when I talk to you about liberal education, uh, I feel I'm, um, uh, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir in some ways, perhaps, uh, we'll see. Uh, I also, uh, my, my very first uh, uh, graduate student, uh, Bill Jones, uh, who got his PhD at the um, Claremont Graduate University and is a fine uh, historian of Germany, uh, is here in the audience. It's very uh, thrilling for me to, to, to see him here. His son is selling books. All proceeds from the books go to financial aid at Wesleyan, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and um, and I, had to, I had lunch with my first ever undergraduate student, who's a, now a staff member at Scripps. So all of that is makes this like a, uh, a personal homecoming in a way that may be different from the other speakers who apparently wrongly talked to you about the fate of American education. Uh, I hear you've been misled by previous speakers who talked to you either about the necessary transformations in liberal education that without which the whole shebang is going to fall apart. Shebang is a technical term I learned in scripts. Uh, <laughs> You've heard from people talk at the end of college, the disintermediation of college, just the unbundling of all the services you get here. I saw these guys playing a game of ball out there it was we were waiting that you bounce a ball on a net. You know, what is this called? You bounce it and then you hit it? Spike ball. So the disintermediating guys, they want to say, how much of your tuition is going to spike ball? Um, and how much of it is going to your classes. Uh, it's a mistake, I think, and it's a mistake that comes partly from ignoring 
the great American tradition of liberal education. I find it odd to say that to you because uh, the CMC has a history of glorifying parts of the American past that I find detestable. Let's get that out of the way. Um, <laughs> but, um, but in this case, in this case, I think there's an American tradition of liberal education that is very different from the European models because of its pragmatism and has the ability to make an enormous difference in the lives of students today, perhaps in ways that are, are more powerful than in any previous generation. So for the next, I don't know, half hour or so, um, I'm going to talk to you about that tradition. And then we'll have time for questions uh, uh, and, and conversation. Uh, I guess I'm supposed to stand up here. But uh, <laughs> I'll walk around a little bit, because I have to uh, in order to think. Uh, uh, the, the, the story I'm going to tell you has four pieces, or four beats to it, four chapters. Um, the first one is liberation. The second one is animation. The third is cooperation. And the fourth is instigation. Pretty good. They rhyme, right? I was very impressed with myself. You don't seem impressed at all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was very impressed when I came up with this guy. I, I, I was in Beijing, actually, uh, to give a talk, uh, this kind of talk, on why liberal education matters. Uh, I don't think the, the book hadn't come out yet. Um, uh, uh, and, and I expected 25, 30 people, because it was winter vacation at Peking University, and the hall was full of a few hundred people, lots of, lots of uh, animation. And there was a, banners around what they said had my name on it. I have no idea. Um, um, and uh, I was so excited. So I had to come up with something great for this group of very animated students and professors at Peking University. So I came up with this rhyme, you know, liberate, animate, cooperate, instigate. You know, I thought it would be. <laughs> and then I start doing my talk, and I realized after every second sentence, the translator would stop me and translate this into Chinese without any effort at all to rhyme. So for the past uh, year, I've been inflicting this scheme on other people uh, in the United States. Liberate. I'm going to start with Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson, as you know, was a man of the Enlightenment. He was uh, a thinker who believed that education was the path to freedom. And without education, freedom would be meaningless or degraded because you would not have the ability to think for yourself. When I say that Jefferson was an Enlightenment man, what I mean is that Jefferson believed in the Kantian maxim from the essay, What is Enlightenment? That enlightenment is freedom from self-imposed immaturity. Now, you're on a college campus, and so you see self-imposed immaturity, usually by Thursday through Sunday, right? right? You, you, I mean, in other words, you can be immature. Sometimes you just don't know stuff. You go to a thing and like, you know, do I pick, do I, am I allowed to have the vegan meal if I'm not a vegan? Now, you don't know that. That's, that's just, you, you're learning. But self-imposed immaturity is when you act like an idiot because you can and you want to. Kant thought enlightenment was freedom from self-imposed immaturity and that education would increase your capacity for that kind of freedom, that kind of liberation. And he thought that could be institutionalized in an institution of higher learning in a university. How? The most important thing, and this is still true today, to make a successful college or university may be more true today than ever before is to do one thing before anything else. And that is to make sure it doesn't look like Harvard. <laughs> Jefferson was committed to this principle. Jefferson was committed to this principle because at Harvard, he said, what would happen is you were going to start at Harvard because you were going to be a minister. You knew that when you were going to start. You were going to start at Harvard because you were going to go into commerce. You were going to, you couldn't have started at Harvard. 
right? right? Because there no women allowed. But when you started, you knew where you would end up. And for Jefferson, that was anathema to education. Because education, if it's free inquiry, is going to lead you not to the reaffirmation of basic principles that you knew when you started, but it would lead you to question the basic principles from which you started in such a way as to open up possibilities of thinking that weren't available to you before. The opposite of dogma. The opposite of religion. So you didn't take a class to shore up your views about intersectionality or your views about the American founding. You took a class to call your own views into question. And through that questioning, you didn't know where you'd wind up except with more questions. Jefferson thought. And he tried to build a university. He did build a university, the University of Virginia, in which this ethos of education as liberation would be fundamental. He said to his frenemy, John Adams, ours will be the follies of enthusiasm, but not of bigotry. I love that phrase. Ours will be the follies of enthusiasm, but not of bigotry. Not wedded to dogma, but wedded perhaps with more passion that is safe to inquiry. Because inquiry would set you free. If you didn't have inquiry, the people with privilege would defend their privileges with power. They would convince you that they deserve their status. And you would have to accept their explanations because you didn't have the intellectual tools to critique them. Without inquiry, without education as liberation, Jefferson thought, that the country would be plagued by a wealthy class that took more and more stuff for itself without the, giving the ability to other people to understand how that accumulation of wealth undermined their own status as citizens. Jefferson thought, for example, that we should have financial aid for students so that you would find poor students, poor, not poor students, poor people, <laughs> low-income people, we would say today, who could benefit so much from an education because they had such talent. He didn't accept the self-serving nonsense of like a Steven Pinker, who probably has been to the Athenaeum, <laughs> who thinks perhaps wealthy people are just genetically superior. They are wealthy. <laughs> um, Jefferson would have thought that's the language of tyranny, not of democracy. Jefferson thought that without education, wealthy people would accumulate more and more stuff, and the government would become more and more bureaucratized, feeding its own engine so as to create simply more jobs for more bureaucrats without having the ability to do anything significant for its citizens because it wouldn't have to because the citizens would be too dumb, self-imposed immaturity, to ask questions. You'd have a dysfunctional government, an elite class of idiotic rich people who were ruling over the rest of us. I'm sorry, I'm getting carried away because it doesn't sound like 1788. Now, surprise for Jefferson to look at the world today in America. That's what happens when people don't know how to question. You want self-imposed immaturity? Look at the rallies. Platitudes, hatred, and vitriol. The kind of things that you can give to children and they cheer, as long as you promise them goodies at the end. And that's what our political process has been dominated by, as we pay attention to who's winning, not to the fascist rhetoric that surrounds the winners. But I digress. Jefferson wanted liberation through education because that would enable citizens to stand up to their government. And it would allow people of talent to stand up to wealthy people, who he thought would dissipate 
whatever talents they had in the pursuit of luxury. Now, I've talked about Jefferson for seven and a half minutes, and I haven't mentioned Sally Hemings. How is that possible, even at CMC? That didn't get the laugh I expected. I mean. uh, how is that possible? You all know Jefferson was a racist. Jefferson was a hypocrite. Jefferson was a bigot. You can go see the show Hamilton, written by a Wesleyan grad, and you can see Jefferson was, uh, was also foolish. We all know that about Jefferson. In fact, usually when I give this talk, that's the first thing anybody knows about Jefferson. And I'm a historian. I'm supposed to say, well, yes, but uh, we shouldn't judge the past by the standards of the present, and Jefferson was a racist, and we can't use our own qual uh, criteria for racism for the past. Well, Jefferson was a racist even by the standards of his own time. He was, everyone around him knew he was a hypocrite. He was famously called so. What interests me about Jefferson, however, is that, in, that his ideas of education as liberation get taken up in the struggle for civil rights in the 19th century. And I just can give you a couple of examples because the night it won't uh, allow for more. The, my favorite example is David Walker, who wrote an appeal to slaves in the United States, and here's where I want to get my quote right, to throw off the shackles of servitude. Poetically, that's a way of saying kill your masters. Kill your masters and free yourselves. David Walker was a free a black in uh, Boston. He wrote the appeal, sewed it into the clothes of travelers. Um, and uh, a price was put on his head. He was to be brought back dead or alive to any of the southern states, preferably alive so he could be tortured to death. But he died of tuberculosis, having authored one of the most powerful appeals for freedom in the struggle to emancipate Africans from slavery in North America. I'm going to read you from 1829. Listen to the rhetoric. Are we not men? We are because we can learn. I pray that the Lord may undeceive my ignorant brethren, Walker writes, and permit them to throw away pretensions and seek after the substance of learning. I would crawl, and this is what all professors like this one, I would crawl on my hands and knees through mud and mire to the feet of a learned man, where I would sit and humbly supplicate him to instill into me that which neither devils nor tyrants could remove only with my life. And here is the ringing conclusion for colored people to acquire learning in this country makes tyrants quake and tremble on their sandy foundation. Walker concludes, the bare name of educating the colored people scares our cruel oppressors almost to death. 1829, Jefferson rhetoric all the way. Much of the appeal is directed against Jefferson's hypocrisy, Jefferson's claim you can't educate black people. But the claim of the appeal is that through education we can live, we, those of us who are enslaved, we can liberate ourselves. Education is the vehicle for freedom. The Jeffersonian rhetoric is much greater than the Jeffersonian racism in American history, or can be when put to good use, as Frederick Douglass did. You know Frederick Douglass's autobiography, perhaps, in which he writes about his life as a slave. Douglass tells the story about how, as a boy, his mistress, while, he was, while this Fred was away with her in Baltimore, taught him how to read. And then the master came to visit the household, and she said, look, look, Freddie can read, open the Bible, anywhere, watch him read. And with fury, the master came and whacked 
Fred, and he ran under the table. I'm dramatizing a little. And he said to his wife words that Frederick Douglass would always remember. You can't teach that boy to read. And she's, well, actually, I, I did. He, he was just reading. You can't teach that boy to read. Reading will make him unfit for slavery. And that's the Jeffersonian phrase that Frederick Douglass would hold in his mind for the rest of his life. Education makes you unfit for slavery because education is a liberation. It's not training to get a job that you fantasize about now that will be completely different by the time you occupy that position. <laughs> education is the path to unslave yourself, liberation from self-imposed immaturity. Douglas used to joke on his speeches, he'd say, I don't know why these white people say uh, black people can't read, aren't smart enough to be taught to read, Douglas would say. They have laws against teaching us to read. Why? No law against teaching a pig to read. No law against teaching cows to read. Why do they have laws against teaching us to read? Why are there practices that keep Africans and African Americans in situations where learning is impossible. There's only one answer, to keep us from having freedom. Education as liberation. Now by now you're very nervous, I think, because I've spoken for so long and I've only gone through one of four beats. <laughs> but the other three will be quicker, I promise you. Although no less scintillating and interesting. The second one is from em Emerson. Emerson said, the task of colleges is not to, ins that to drill you to make sure you memorized your problem sets or go to your tutor to get the answers to hand into the professor who goes to the tutor and pays the tutor so she doesn't have to teach you. The task of education, the task of education is to animate you so that you can animate the world more fully. What did he mean to this? And he said this at Harvard of all places. Went there, he said, he said in his, one of his um, speeches to the students and faculty, he said, you know, if you're being taught to memorize things and just to learn things to repeat to your professors, you should get out now. You should run to the hills. Because what should happen in a college or a university is that you should learn to make the world alive in ways you didn't know it was alive before. What he meant by that was pretty simple. It happens, I'm sure, here at CMC all the time. You, you, you talk to people who you thought, I, would never I never knew I would talk to somebody like that, either from that part of the world or with those interests or with those views. And suddenly, people who are off limits in your mind are suddenly part of your world. They're alive for you in ways they wouldn't have been had you not been here at this wonderful school. You probably hear music that the first time you hear it, you think, Is that, that's music? But you learn to listen to it in such a way as it becomes not, maybe not beautiful, but alive. You animate it. I had a brilliant professor, extraordinary teacher and dear friend, Carl Shorsky, um, who, who um, uh, used to give an extra class when I was a graduate student at Princeton. Um, he used to give an extra class on Wagner. Come, you want to come to an extra class in the middle of the week from like 7 to 11 at night? You don't, have, no, you don't have to, but it's on Wagner. I was like, oh, well, oh, sure. I had never met anyone who had been to a Wagner opera, let alone ha listened to any. I, I just thought it wasn't for people like me. My parents didn't go to uh, college. They, they didn't know from opera, they would have said. <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, I was, you know, not, I think I should go, but being a very nerdy person, well, maybe you'll notice if I'm not there. So I went. And I listened to the beginning of the, the music, he was talking to us, and I thought, this is not, you know, I like Bob Dylan. You know, that's, you know, I, did, I, did, I stopped listening to music when I was at Scripps that was new. You know, I just listened to the same uh, five bands and, and Dylan. Um, and uh, anyway, but by the end of that night, that music was so alive to me, so powerful to me, and so beautiful in its intensity uh, that I was walking on air. 
And I've taught Wagner ever since, actually, in my intellectual history classes. And I've had that same experience with students. Not all students, all the time. I had a group of students from CMC who had this experience of animation. They were two tough guys. They were taking an intellectual history course at Scripps. I don't know what they were really thinking. <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was 1986. They were like, hey, man, oh, lots of women in this class. It's Scripps, guys, you know. All right. Well, I'll just sit here, you know. Um, and, and, and so we, the semester went on, and we got to Baudelaire. I kid you not. I kid you not. We got to Baudelaire. We're reading Paris Spleen. There's an extraordinary poem in there called Make Life Beautiful. Some of you know it. Uh, I know some of them know it because my wife is here. She teaches it, too. Um, um, and and, it's, and at the, it's, a, it's a story about um, a, 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 a very nasty person at the end of the poem, after having destroyed somebody's uh, livelihood um, because he was too banal, they scream, make, he screams, make life beautiful. Don't just walk through your life. Don't sleep through your life. Don't just follow a path. What if at every day you try to make your life or life more generally more beautiful? And these two guys <laughs> took this to heart. They were like, it was like they had ingested a drug. They were like, oh my God, we have to do that at CMC. <laughs> so it, I said, what do you mean? He said, we have to get everyone to make life more beautiful. <laughs> and, I, and you know, I didn't have tenure yet. So I was like, <laughs> whoa, the slow guys, you know. And what do you mean? Oh, don't worry, oh, Professor Roth, we have, we have. So what they did is they would get their trays and sit by, I guess, in the, in the dining room over, over, right over there. And as people came out with their food, they'd go, make life beautiful! <laughs> and occasionally, they would, people would drop their stuff, and they thought that was hilarious <laughs> and beautiful. And part of, because what they did was they broke the rote part of life. They broke the part of life that is expected. What happens, what Emerson worried about, I know I'm going on too long, but what Emerson worried about was that you were going to be trained at great schools like this one, and like mine, and like the schools around us. You would be trained to take more and more for granted and focus more and more on what you're going to do. Like a laser beam. <laughs> and Emerson thought, and Emerson thought this was a destruction of your soul. Because it is. <laughs> what you should instead have is a capacious sensibility that allows you to see how alive the world is. To be more and more distracted not more and more focused. Any fool can get focused. Try getting interestingly distracted. That's what Emerson meant by making the world alive, because you are more alive. You're vivacious. Emerson thought that's what education should be. That's number two. Number three, cooperation. It's a little different, because cooperation is not just about the individual, right? Uh, Jefferson, it's all about the individual. S s s freedom from self-imposed immaturity. Emerson, it's really about the individual. You fall in love with, uh, 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 with making life beautiful, or with uh, Wagner, or with Dylan, or whatever it is. Um, what's his name? Uh, Ryan Adams. You know this guy, this independent rock and roll? I'm trying to be hip now, and it's not working. Uh, you know, Ryan Adams just did a cover album of Taylor Swift songs. You know this? You're looking at me like, is this part of the lecture? Or is this the? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's part of the lecture. Pay attention. You know, Ryan Adams, he did this. He, he said, Taylor Swift, beneath contempt for a cool independent rocker like me, right? You know, <laughs> beneath contempt. And Ryan Adams said, no. Oh, my goodness. He went overwards. It's like Shakespeare. And he made an album of this 1989, right? Is it just called? Yeah. But, but because for I think what happened, right? I don't know Ryan Adams. Yet, <laughs> if I keep giving this talk, he'll call me. <laughs> what happened, I think, to Ryan Adams is he was listening to stuff on the radio. You just hear it, you hear it, you don't really hear it. And suddenly he heard it. And you've all had this experience with poetry or music or painting. It's suddenly, it's not just wallpaper. It's not just part of the background. It's alive. And education should do that. Also, it's an individual thing. Cooperation, as promised. I'm going to talk to you about... Jane Addams. Jane Addams was a really smart 
young woman grew, grew, growing up in Illinois. She wanted to go to college. There weren't a lot of choices for women. She was going to go to Smith, become a doctor. She said to her father, I'm going to go to finish my studies here under your tutelage, and then I want to go to Northampton. I want to become a doctor. Her father, who was a, I guess we call a notable, kind of a local, not celebrity, but powerful person, wealthy, uh, Republican in Illinois, he, um, he said, listen, Jane, you're, you're a girl. You're a little fra He didn't actually have this accent, but <laughs> <laughs> I, only, I have a limited repertoire. Uh, and, and, and he said, you should, you, should, you should go to the convent school uh, not far from here. And she said, okay, okay, I'll do that. But I want to show you what I can do. So she went to this convent school, and she knocked the ball out of the park. She was editor, editor of the newspaper, like my friend here at the head table. You know, she, uh, she, she got, got all A's. She was a campus leader. She was, you know, she, when they wanted to occupy the president's office, she said, no, let's have a conversation. No, she didn't do that. Um, <laughs> um, she was a great campus leader. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Still ill president joke there. Uh, so, so, so she comes home from, from, uh, from the convent school, and she says to her father, Daddy, hey, I did it. I want to go to, now I want to go to Smith. And he said, sweetheart, you're still a girl, and you're kind of nervous. That's a word they used in the 19th century for neurotic, which is the word they used in the early 20th century for differently abled by, no, they're just crazy is really what I'm trying to say. Um, she was weird and weak and fragile and nervous and a girl. And so he said, no. She was devastated. She thought she'd hit all the marks to be uh, launched into this world that she wanted to be part of. And then what happened? Her father died. <laughs> Don't clap. That's not nice. <laughs> Patriarchy may be deserved to die, but clap silently. Um, but you know what happened. You probably do, coming from Berkeley. You know what happened. <laughs> Does she go to Smith? No. Where's the political scientist Freudian, who I spoke to at the beginning? He was around. He may have. Did he leave already? Uh, you know, uh, he uh, she, she decides to obey her father, because if you've studied Freud for as long as I have, you know that the most powerful father is a dead father. <laughs> All right. that, that's when you should have clapped. That's when you should have clapped. So Jane Addams says, well, I guess I can't go to Smith. I guess I can't do all this stuff because I should obey my father. And now she has all this money. So she gets some friends, and they go on the, the, the other kind of education. They go on the grand tour. They go around Europe. They visit museums. They do all kinds of things. And she's learning. She's just w wicked smart, as we say in the East. <laughs> um, and um, uh, you would say hella smart, I think. Is that right? <laughs> Um, and and uh, is that right? Is that right? No? Is that Northern California? That's Northern California. Okay. So I don't, don't tell me that. <laughs> Can't hold all this together. So, so she's on the tour, and she's in London with her friends, and she walk, looks down the side, and she sees a guy about to cross the street and step right in front of a carriage that's, horse-drawn carriages, knock him over. Terrible accident. And she thinks to herself, that reminds me of a verse in De Musée, which is about a portion of a text of Homer's, which is about the failure to act properly when you see a tragedy in front of you. This is what's going through her mind while this tragedy unfolds in front of her. And then she catches herself, and she says, I have lumbered my mind with literature. Isn't that a great phrase? I have lumbered my mind with literature. I have studied so damn much that I can't think in a way that allows me to act. You've met people like that. You've taken their classes. <laughs> no, it's an occupational hazard, right? On the one hand, on the other hand. On the other foot, right? I can't do the other foot, uh, right? And that's what happened. Jane Addams realizes that her quest for knowledge was going to handicap her ability to act. She goes home to Chicago. 
She founds Hull House, the first kind of social services organization, not to serve the poor, but to work with them in partnership, what we would today call community partnership. She works with poor people and immigrants. She becomes someone who learns by working in community because she realizes that she had been tracked to learn how to free herself through her mind. What she wanted to do was to create conditions for people to free themselves together through practice through action. She was a pragmatist. She was a great fan of William James, who was a great fan of Jane Addams. James, who said, what we have to do in school is not just get deeper and deeper into a subject, but actually look up from our subject to see things from another person's point of view. James said, to overcome a blindness that we deepen through our pursuit of study. We deepen our blindness because we get more and more into one field, not seeing things from outside that field. Jane Adams knew that very well. And she put herself to work to overcome the ways in which we are blind to each other's suffering and potential. In this regard, she was a great ally of the most important philosopher who dealt with education in the American tradition, which is John Dewey. Dewey knew that American society had this streak of individualism, but he thought of it as a pathology. He thought that schools encouraged people to do things on their own, learn to do things on your own, and which he thought cultivated narcissism at best and a kind of sick isolationism at worst. Instead, we should learn to do things in concert, because by learning in concert, with one another, we also acquire the values that would allow us to put what we are learning in the service of the group that's doing the learning. We're not learning from the professor. We're learning as a group, as a collectivity. Jane Addams was committed to this view. Dewey was committed to this view. It is the view of the most important, I think, philosophical school in American history, that is, the pragmatist school. School is a, maybe the wrong word exactly, a school that knew there was no foundation but the one we created for ourselves through working and learning together. That brings me to my last point. We've gone through liberate, animate, cooperate, and the last one is instigate. People have urged me to say innovate, so I would be more corporate friendly. <laughs> and if you like that, that's fine. But instigate is the word that comes to mind, especially because of the events of last fall on college campuses all over the country. Instigate is what we hope happens through liberal education. What do I mean by that? I take this from a teacher I had, another teacher I had, a great uh, teacher and philosopher, Richard Rorty who wrote that the task of education in America for the first 12 years should be really to inculcate in the students the values of the culture, to really try to get people to have many things in common, including techniques of analysis and interpretation and quantitative skills. But the task of those first years, however many there should be, should be to acquire something that once you get to college, you are instigated to reject. That what should happen for undergraduates who are worth their salts is that they should reject the terms on which the education is offered to them. They should not be like that early Harvard undergrad who started education because he knew he was going to be a minister. They should start their education because they don't know where they're going to end up. And their professors may tell them where they think they should end up. The career center certainly will. The administration might. Here you make a big deal about leadership, for example. I wouldn't. I have met some of the would-be leaders of our country. Instead, Rorty suggests what should happen in colleges and universities is that we should provide students with an instigation to overthrow what we are telling them. 
to reject the very terms of the education that we offer. That's hard to do. That's why your president, perhaps, I'm just guessing from what I read, offered to join the protesters in the fall. Because we don't think protest is anathema to education. We think that without protest, without instigating change, education is a wasted series of drills. In order to know if your education is leading to liberation, you should be instigated to step outside the values that we oldsters have been given. That's a pragmatic thing to do. Not the cultivation of coddled minds or narcissistic millennials or lazy young people. Old people have been saying that about college students as long as there have been college students. <laughs> Jefferson wrote letters to people, what should I do about these students who got drunk and threw rocks at the professor's house? <laughs> should I deal with it with the cops or should I deal with it internally? Very familiar stuff. <laughs> Throughout the 20th century, but that's small potatoes. Jefferson knew that was small potatoes. Jefferson was a revolutionary. A stupid prank at your professor's house is exactly what, we, what, the, what, the, what the homogenizers want you to do. Let off some steam and then go to work and, and not make any noise. Or make your noise at night and don't disturb the people who, to whom you report. Instead, what should happen is that your education should be an exercise in liberation, an exercise that allows you to make the world more alive and you cooperate with one another to instigate the possibilities of change. Without that, we're in deep trouble. I have four or five Chinese translators writing to me, I want to work on your book on liberal education because in China, the education is too rote. Too much drilling, not enough instigation of change. In America, we have a chorus of naysayers who say, get out of places like CMC, go to a coding academy so you'll learn how to uh, code and do quantitative analysis and just do what you're told. I've not met one of those people who are successful who send their own kids to one of these places. <laughs> Instead, of going down the road of, road of being the call center of the world in your generation. We need you to embrace this pragmatic liberal education tradition in the United, of the United States to instigate change in the service of liberation through cooperating with one another. The world will become more alive if you do that. We are desperate for you to do that. Because that's the only way, I think, not only will this country thrive, but will we be able to face some of the most important challenges ahead of us. We're counting on you to do it. Thank you very much. We now have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and Shannon or I will come to you with a microphone. As always, priority will go to students. Hi, thank you so much for coming and talking to us tonight. You're welcome. Um, so I want to sort of follow on that last point that you, well, sort of the conclusion you made there um, about the importance of education for essentially liberating yourself, liberating a population. Um, it seems like if it's really so important, then that should be the mission of the K-12 education system or some sort of education system that is available to all people um, rather than one that is available merely to sort of a privileged class, the upper middle class, upper class. Um, so how does that fit in with your vision of what education should be? Um, and what do you see as sort of the interplay between our K-12 system and higher education and the liberal arts? It's a great question, and uh, I, I do think that uh, a important goal and a very a necessary goal is significant improvement of our 
K to 12 uh, education systems. Uh, and I do think that colleges and universities, especially wealthy ones, uh, can play a much more direct role in that regard, actually, uh, in modeling best practices and creating academies uh, uh, and, and several other things. However, uh, I do think that um, access to a higher education is something that will not be limited, cannot be limited to just middle class and upper middle class people in the future. If that, if I'm, however, lots of the direct, uh, lots of the energy is going in the other direction. Here in California, um, as in many states around the country, in my state, Connecticut, is extraordinary defunding of public access to uh, universities and, and colleges. And uh, but I don't think that. There, you can substitute a high quality uh, K through 12 education for the kind of uh, instigation of change and rebellion that uh, might characterize higher education. So yes, I do think that a liberal education is appropriate at the K through 12 level. I think that, in other words, showing the interconnection of, of fields, showing the conceptual basis of them. Uh, I do think that, um, the uh, teaching st students how to learn is something that starts in the, that sector. Uh, but I wouldn't um, uh, de-emphasize the uh, higher education because it's uh, because of social class, because uh, that would be a tremendous step backward uh, from even from let's say the GI Bill uh, or the vision even and the vision of someone like Jefferson. Jefferson didn't put it very felicitously, but he said he wanted to rake the rubbish to find talented poor people um, uh, to go for free to universities and colleges. And, but that, that discourse, uh, and there are people in the room who know it better than I do, uh, uh, around uh, whether we should have a national university in the United States, uh, or what is the responsibility of the country as a whole to provide access to uh, higher education, that, that's been there for a long time, and I would uh, not give up on that uh, because it has at times been uh, for a, a privilege, a class privilege. Uh, thank you so much for your talk there. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you. I was wondering uh, where you think the limits of a liberal arts education lie in two regards. Um, so first of all, to what extent do you think that the um, small size and residential character of liberal arts colleges is intrinsic to the type of education they provide? And secondly, um, to what extent do you think that the CMC model, like more vocational, uh, more practical, you could say, um, model of education is uh, compatible with your view of the liberal arts? Thank you, it's a great, great, uh, great question. Well, on, this, on the question of scale, I think it's really uh, an interesting moment in uh, higher ed because there are very interesting experiments at, at massive scales that I find fascinating. I met tonight a, a student who's here at Pomona College who took my MOOC when she was in China. And I think there are about 150,000 people who, uh, or so who've signed up at least <laughs> for uh, the course called the Modern and the Postmodern. It's a great books course, or good enough books course. You know, we start with, we start with Kant and we, you know, we read Virginia Woolf, we read Baudelaire, we read, uh, and, and, and this is online. Students can have discussions in small groups, uh, but this course reaches a, a, a lot of people. It's very different, and I've spent my life in you know, places this size. Uh, Wesleyan's got 3,000 students now. That's, that's as big as I've had uh, physically. But I think the possibility of experimenting with liberal education at different, uh, with different modalities of scale, really interesting. There's nothing inherent to liberal education, in liberal education, in my view, that demands a seminar. Seminar was a research tool of the German university in the late 19th century. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not related to liberal education. You can have a seminar that's vocational, and you can have a seminar that has something that's liberal education, which leads me to your second question. What are the limits to this? I, I, I'm just uh, channeling Dewey as best I can here. Although, you know, Dewey was a, um, uh, he, he got everything right, but he, he, he said it such, in such a terrible way. You know, Oliver Wendell Holmes said about Dewey that um, if God uh, 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 could speak, God would say what John Dewey says, if God was inarticulate. 
He got it right, but he, he, was, he screwed up uh, the language. What Dewey said was that, uh, that any field could be part of liberal education. That's where the American tradition is different. Jefferson agreed. Uh, it, it, different from the European tradition, which tried to identify specific fields that were like really in the wheelhouse of liberal education. Greek, yes. Management, no. Right? Religion, for many people, yes. Um, economics, eh. Some people found the sciences. At Scripps was the first school to have liberal arts, uh, sorry, fine arts in the in a liberal arts college because it's very technical. Some people say, oh, you can't do that. What Dewey said was, if you are teaching whatever field it is, auto mechanics or, or, uh, or philosophy, teaching it in such a way as you draw out the interconnection of that field to other fields, as well as the conceptual framework for the field, then you're teaching it in the mode of liberal education. Anything can be taught that way. And you could teach philosophy as a technical discipline. That's been the goal of American philosophy for 50 years, <laughs> right? To take all the interest out, and no, sorry, just to, dr <laughs> to really narrow its focus, and, and some classes are like that, making believe the students are gonna become professors one day and just getting to act like a professor. That's not liberal education. Liberal education is exposing the interconnection of the thing you're studying with the context around it, and teasing out the conceptual apparatus or framework of whatever you're, you're working on so that you learn to learn. So that inquiry continues when the class is done. Well, it could, that could be hairdressing. If you think, I've learned it all, I don't need to know anything, then it's not, it wasn't liberal education. If you learn how to adapt to changes because you have the framework and the interconnection, then it is. So I, 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 we're starting a design and engineering program at Wesleyan. Um, and uh, you know, it, 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 it took a while for me to get some support to do it, but I, I, we're not gonna teach it like they teach it in a technical engineering program, but if people build bridges, they still have to stand up. Just like when we teach French, we don't just teach people to talk about France in English or just talk about the French. They have to learn how to speak French, and that's a technical skill. So you can do both or you can abandon the project in favor of mere training. So you learn how to speak with a really good accent, but you have no idea what you're saying. Thank you for speaking. Thank you for speaking with us tonight. How does academic research, or our professor's research, play into this and help us with our liberal education? So the question is, how does academic research, the professor's research, uh, play into this view of liberal education? It's a great question. and I. Uh, Thank you for asking it. I, I, I think that you know, I, I, I have been part of schools all my, uh, ever since I went to college, that believe in the scholar-teacher model. Uh, however, I am aware of uh, uh, research that, that shows that uh, there's very little evidence that people who do active research are better teachers as a rule, uh, or that there's a very, that there's a strong correlation there. So. Um, so I, I want to be careful not to just trot out my prejudices. It may not seem that I care about being that careful, <laughs> but, but I, I, I am. Uh, uh, I think that at a place like CMC and Scripps and Pomona and, and RV Mudd and Pitzer, uh, and I leave anybody out, they're more now than they used to be, <laughs> uh, even at the graduate school, uh, that the, that the uh, research of the professors are so, is so important because the students see modeled right before them what it means to be struggling with inquiry all the time. So that it's one thing to talk to somebody, like I, te I taught Europe since 1648, every year. And the students could say, well, Roth, he's just repeating the lecture from last year. Uh, every year I tried, I added something new, I took on a new subject, I added lectures, and, and, and I was doing my own research in other fields. And I felt, and I hope the students felt, they seemed to think so, that, that the fact that I was trying to learn with all my heart, with all my might, made them think learning was something that wasn't just about performance on an exam or a paper. And I do think that counts for an enormous amount. So at Wesleyan, if you are a great researcher, but you're a, students think you're a crappy teacher, 
Doesn't matter how great the research is. You can go to an Ivy League school for that. <laughs> so, are you still there? Um, in, right? I mean, you all know they're famous for not, you know, they don't care. Um, uh, but at a place like CMC, and, well, let me just stick to Wesleyan. At Wesleyan, if you're a great teacher and the students love you, but you can't get work done, then you're not going to stay. Because we want the students to see what it means to continue to learn and to contribute to a field. I think that's very important for schools our size. But I am certainly willing to accept the possibility, or even the reality, that some people could be really great teachers and they haven't done any new intellectual work in decades. But I think that, that that's, they're good for online teaching. For, I think that would be great. But I think being in a small class with someone and seeing how they struggle with the work it's really important. I, and I, the last thing I'll say about that, that doesn't mean that they have to produce like an article every, I don't know, X months or years, or it has to be cited by you know, a certain number of people. That, 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 I think, those are technical issues, but I, I think that they can be overrated. But what can't be overrated is the notion that you are studying with someone who continues to study and is not just giving you what they learned before. Another question back there? Uh, thank you for your talk. You mentioned that you taught, you have a course on Coursera, and I was wondering if you could talk more about um, what opportunities the internet offers us, especially since it can um, approach people who don't have to bear the cost of, uh, or who might not be able to handle the cost of $65,000 a year, which yeah. as a lot of us would tell you, it's a lot. It's a lot, uh, absolutely. Well, that's where we got into this. Wesleyan was the first liberal arts college that got into the, uh, the MOOC madness. Um, and uh, I offered this course, the modern and the postmodern. And I got five other Wesleyan uh, faculty members who had been teaching that Wesleyan, for a most of them for a long time. One in economics, one in classics, one in film, and one in statistics. So very different fields. And each person said, you mean we can give this, these courses in thou we thought thousands, a few thousand people around the world would take them? As one my economics colleague said, that's, that's really cool. He used another word than really, but uh, and, and he just said, that's so cool. Let's try that. Like, we don't know exactly what the outcome will be. Um, and all of us found that it wasn't nearly the same as teaching in person. And they didn't have the same uh, 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 feeling of accomplishment with the students. But on the other hand, um, we've had more than, I think it's 1.5 million students now sign up for Wesleyan classes, and um, you know the the satisfaction rate is actually in the high 90s from students who who uh, are surveyed, uh, and I, I've had extraordinary uh, uh, teaching experiences with my students online. Uh, I have found it really an amazing process. So what does that tell us? Well, we know. Uh, that nobody should go to college to get information they can get on their phone. I mean, there are like five books out that that's their central thesis. Why anybody would pay to get a book that said what I just said when they could have paid me? No, <laughs> um, that, that's just crazy. Of course, you, you would never go to college to find out what you can get on your phone. You can, because you sit in class sometimes, you think the teacher's wrong. You probably, you know, oh, really? Jane Addams went to London? I don't think so, right? Um, you can do that on your phone, but what you can't, what, so what, what happens in the classroom more than ever is liberated from the necessity of transmitting information. So what should happen is that teaching should become even a, more of a performance in the best sense, and it should be more of a collaboration in the deepest sense. Uh, and online, that can happen. But you, you know, you guys who are, I'm no digital native, um, I, I, I came to this very skeptically, but I found in my discussion group sessions and Google Hangouts with my students all over the world that their embrace of uh, these texts in the modern and the postmodern and their, and their questioning about issues of freedom, aesthetics, power, uh, philosophy, that they were as, as urgent to them as the students I have at, at school. So I think, and I, my guess, my, not a guess, we all know that whatever the MOOCs are like today or these other online vehicles, they're gonna be so much better in 10 years. And 
I think it, it's an, I, I'm excited that that's a great possibility for uh, the spread of liberal education. I have many colleagues who think that I am stabbing liberal education in the back by, you know, use, by using the internet in this way or undermining the basis for schools like this. I don't think so. I have more and more people who want to come to Wesleyan because they see these classes online. When MIT put all its classes online, applications went way up. You don't go to CMC or Wesleyan just to go to class. But at MIT they found nobody's going to class. Now that's important because that means the classes are not good. And, and so they have to do something more with their opportunity to teach than they were doing before. That's a great, th I'm glad the internet does that. Because we should make teaching the most powerful and exciting thing we do and then our students will be in class. They'll be in class, not because they're taking attendance, but because it's a great opportunity. There's a handle all the way up here. And there's one back there, too. Hi. Um, so you, you said that every uh, topic could be approached from a liberal arts perspective. Uh, I guess I was wondering, though, if in your ideal sort of liberal arts context, you would advocate kind of any core curriculum? Or huh. do you think because of that, you know, it's kind of up for grabs? Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Any core curriculum. Um, well, I'm a Wesleyan kid. You know, I went to, that's where I went as an undergraduate. and. Uh, uh, I love script when its core was anything you want. <laughs> um, and uh, so at Wesleyan, there are no requirements. Uh, there are expectations, which means we, we manage through guilt, is that realize, you know, <laughs> you really should take a science. Um, and um, you real, I'm going to be disappointed if you don't do a math class. You know, I, was, I had so much guilt as a child, I was, I was impervious to this as a student. Um, um, and, and so, uh, I think at Wesleyan it works really well. I mean, my colleagues would say 87% of all our students fulfill the expectations. 99% of all the, student, the science majors fulfill the expectations. Um, draw your own conclusions. Um, uh, the, the, but for Wesleyan student body, that works for pretty well. The problem when you have distribution requirements instead of a core, core curriculum is that you have this incentive to create classes that nobody takes seriously. Professors don't take it seriously. Students don't take it seriously. We used to call, I don't know what the, I, I guess we, I, this was when I was here. Uh, we used to call it uh, rocks for jocks. It was a geology class. I don't know, is that moons for goons, the astronomy class. Uh, at Westing, it's physics for presidents. Um, <laughs> highest, highest rate of cheating in the university by like, uh, I don't know, order of magnitude. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, the, and, you know, it's because, it, because it's, it's, you're checking off a box. Dewey said it, again, Dewey said it so I said, you shouldn't care what you've taken, you should care what you've done. So, now, at some schools, the culture of the school requires other kinds of mechanisms for getting people to do things that are interesting. Columbia has a core curriculum that's very interesting, Chicago does, of course, and other schools, and I, I don't know what currently you it at CMC if it's more core, more distribution. So each, I don't think there's one framework for this that works for every school, every culture. Um, but I do think that that thing that Dewey said is so important. It doesn't matter what you've taken. And the proof of that is if I ask the seniors in the room what they took sophomore year, most of you will have a hard time even listing them. Uh, and what does matter is what did you do sophomore year that you actually are proud of in your classes? Um, and I would like to see us, everybody have, instead of a transcript, because you all get a, A's, A minuses, and the occasional B plus if you had a bad Thursday. Um, you know, I'd like you to be able to say, here's what I did sophomore year. Here's the project. And here's another project I did. And then in junior year, here's the next stuff. And if in junior year, I can't see that the projects are better than they were when you were a first year student, I think you should drop out. I think you should leave. And I, I think there's, and we should, we should be able to evaluate those projects, not just you evaluating your own projects. And then when you're a senior, you should have, like artists do, portfolios. Grades don't matter. But that's, that's idealistic, um, and I don't have total power yet, uh, so I can't, I can't institute that. So the, uh, the long answer is there are a lot of different ways to get there, but what I hope the there for me is not what you take, but what you do.
and how what you do reflects a wide variety of inputs. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, I do political work, and I have fantastic colleagues at Wesleyan, so it's very exciting to see you here. Um, Are they, have they taken over my office today or anything? Um, I think that's tomorrow, okay. before you get back to <laughs> um, So, So my question is around this idea of the liberal arts as a creation of change makers and people who are really challenged privilege. Um, there's a piece of the liberal arts that doesn't quite seem to fit with that, and that's this idea that the board of trustees, a group of people who are drawn together both by their love of the college and by their ability to accumulate a lot of money, um, have the final say over a lot of pieces of what happens at our colleges. Whoa, really? There are, I mean, you believe that? It's the president who has the final say. Yeah, over certain things. Uh, but so, so I think, at least for me, I see some kind of contradiction in that, and I'd love to hear you speak on that. <sighs> yes, well, I don't see the contradiction, but let me, let me, uh, I mean, in other words, I, I, I don't think that the uh, wealthy people are necessarily people who haven't instigated change or challenged the status quo. Sometimes they just got lucky and inherited money or married the right person but sometimes they actually earn their money um, uh, and, and in ways that are extraordinarily um, creative, entrepreneurial, and dynamic. I had the good fortune to have such a person chairing my board, and uh, I don't say that because this is being recorded and I'm gonna send it to him, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, he's, he, he created a, a pharmaceutical com company that eventually cured a major disease and, and, and you know, and he's now trying to cure another one. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm uh, in awe of the dedication and, and contrarian, productive contrarianness. That's maybe what we're talking about. Can you, how can you be a productive contrarian? Um, productive may sound, yeah, that's fine. Uh, a creative contrarian. And so many protesters think of themselves that way, creative contrarians. But they can also be as full of groupthink as, as any corporate board, um, a monolithic, not self-questioning, and uh, dedicated to debating the intricacies of uh, position papers that have real no import for how people live. I've seen, I've been part of radical groups that do that. <laughs> the Yellow Rose Life Force, an anarchist group from Texas with which I went to Seabrook, New Hampshire. That's what we did. We were, we were getting on the nuances of anarchism. Should we lie down in the road together? Or should, well, it should be everybody's choice. This kid's 12 years old. He's going to lie down in the road in front of a truck? It's his choice. When is a choice? We got into that, right? <laughs> so my board has never gotten into that detail. <laughs> uh, so could this university or college, or should it be more democratic? In, maybe that's what you mean. Um, the issue is that the college or university doesn't just belong to the students who are here now and the professors. It belongs to all your alumni who are constituents of the school. And the, um, the Board of Trustees at our school, it may be different here because it's a younger institution, there are 32 people, 31 are alums, and nine of them are elected by the alums. The others are appointed by alums to alum. So um, I think that that's a vehicle for um, balancing the energies uh, of the campus. However, um, the board has only oversight over the functions and, uh, the, that r are run by the administration and the policies that are set by the, in, the administration in a joint governance process with the faculty and students. If my board said no to something I suggested, I would quit. They know that, and I know that. You know, their job is to support the president or fire the president. And so, I tell the students, and the students, well, my students are going to have a meeting with some board members because they don't believe that. They think I must be beholden to the board. And a lot of people say, presidents sometimes say, I'd love to, but the board will never go for it. And that can happen, I guess. But uh, in my view, my, my job is to t explain to students and faculty and alumni and parents some di different views in time why we're making the decisions we've made to be transparent about it, to, be, to articulate the reasons, to listen to objections take them into consideration. Um, so a significant number of Wesleyan students, give one example, uh, want to divest from um, uh, fo fossil fuels. Um, and uh, there are a significant number of board members who don't. Um, and 
uh, for I think with good reason, although, um, although I myself find this uh, a difficult issue. Uh, uh, we had a presentation from a group of students, a student investor committee, saying, you know, we have our differences about some of this, but coal, coal. And they went through all the stuff around coal. And the board said, yeah, we shouldn't, nah, we shouldn't invest in any, no coal. And as it turns out, we're not investing in any coal. <laughs> But we won't. And so I thought that was a good moment where there was this inter-exchange. I think in the end, you can't run a college university just by plebiscites. That having a governing board that's responsive to its constituencies is important. But not just uh, reflecting their will. We closed all the fraternities this year. I don't know. I didn't ask the alumni to take a vote. That was my decision, and if the board didn't want to do it, I, they'd have to get me president. So I think that balance can work without, creating, without being stifling. And it's the president's job to lead the board. The board doesn't lead the administration. Unfortunately, that's all the time we'll have for questions tonight. Please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you.